call the meeting to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for our invocation. Tonight, Pastor Rod Warrenberg of the Desert Creek Fellowship Church is here with us. Thank you, Mayor. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight in the name of your Son, Jesus. And Father, I pray for the people that you have put over us to lead us and to govern us. Father, I pray that you would help them, give them insight and wisdom and understanding. Father, help them to govern your people well. Help this, Father, to be a productive meeting. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. <clears throat> Roll call, please, Beth. Mayor Kavanaugh? Here. Vice Mayor Magazine? Here. Councilmember Yates? Present. Councilmember DePorter is absent. Councilmember Brown? Here. Councilmember Tolis? Here. Councilmember Leger? Here. All right. We're going to jump right into the semi annual update by the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office. Captain Hank. Randomart. You're up. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Mr. Vice Mayor, members of the council, and members of the community. Uh, tonight, I want to take the opportunity to present some uh, updates re occur uh, regarding staffing as well as uh, crime trends in, in the community. The first thing I want to talk about is the current staffing levels, and this is what the town uh, pays for by contract. We have 36 employees that are assigned to the Fountain Hills substation. One captain, one lieutenant, a community outreach deputy, a school resource deputy, one administrative assistant that handles all of the paperwork that flows throughout the sheriff's substation, seven patrol sergeants, 20 patrol deputies, one detective sergeant, and three district detectives, meaning three detectives that are assigned to Fountain Hills. In addition to what's contractually obligated on behalf of the Sheriff's Office, the column to the left are our additional resources, which include our Homicide Unit, our Child Crimes Unit, Special Victims Unit, Arson, our Forensics Unit, which also in, in, uh, excuse me, includes Computer Crimes, our Communications and Dispatch, Canine SWAT and Aviation, Search and Rescue, Posse Operations, and Text to Tip. The reason I put text to tip on there is, as you know, we recently transitioned from text to tip being operated by the coalition in the town of Fountain Hills to being operated by MCSO. This was brought about as a result of the federal court order, which required MCSO to warehouse all of our tips in one location and provide uh, follow up information regarding our actions taken on each tip. So what we did because it so worked, worked well, so here, uh, gosh. Because it worked so well here, we transitioned it and expanded it throughout the sheriff's office. What that does is it gives us the capability to send information not only throughout Maricopa County to other agencies that operate on this system, but throughout the United States as well as receive information. Um, currently, the way the system works is it works under the same premise that you can text a tip anonymously. It goes to our silo unit, which is our intelligence unit. They vet the information and then they distribute the tip to where it needs to go for proper investigation. If it's an in-progress issue, they process it as a call for service. Uh, if it's an investigative tip, then they send it to the appropriate investigative detail to do follow-up on that tip. The plus side to all of this is tips don't fall into the black hole anymore. Every tip that we receive is acted upon and we provide documentation of, of our action. So that's been a positive. The next thing I would like to discuss are key staff changes that I've made in the very short amount of time that I've been here as the captain. Uh, missing in action is our school resource officer, Deputy Michael Brooks. He got his dates confused. He was here for the last meeting and thought that he would be introduced and was not. So I'd like to take a moment and introduce our detective sergeant, Kristen Banks. Uh, Kristen is an experienced investigative unit supervisor uh, who has a great amount of experience putting together these complicated investigations that hit the town from time to time. Next, I'd like to introduce our newly assigned lieutenant, Lieutenant Rich Johnson. Hello. Rich, mm -hmm. 
Rich Johnson is a 17-year veteran and comes to us from the Professional Standards Bureau or what we commonly refer to as Internal Affairs. Mm -hmm. could, you, could you maybe come up here because and unless you're um, here, you won't be on camera for everybody to see you and you can just, I mean, you can just maybe go stand to, the, to the, stand next to your captain and please. It's, it's like Sergeant. a mug shot. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's going to say, we couldn't see them. I think it's just to highlight exactly how short I am. <laughs> oh. <laughs> hmm. Welcome. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Next, I would like to discuss briefly our efforts with respect to community involvement in Fountain Hills. Uh, we participate in a national drug take back and the next date in town is scheduled for August 20 or excuse me October 28th. Although every day is drug take back in the town of Fountain Hills as you know the coalition maintains the drug turn in box which is located outside of our substation. Um, we have an active participation along with the Fountain Hills coalition to address issues within our school and throughout our community with respect to drug issues and uh, abuse of substances. We routinely, quarterly, try to do coffee with a cop, and I know that a lot of you have attended those, and they've been very successful. Uh, we tried a new event recently, and that's the Froyo Cops and Kids. Um, the Oyo Frozen Yogurt uh, graciously agreed to provide free yogurt to school-age children, and it gave us an opportunity to interact with them and kind of discuss what we do, as well as uh, reduce some of the stigma that's associated with folks in uniform because in a time of crisis or an emergency we want those kids to seek us out uh, for shelter and support. Uh, we also participated in the back to school bash, uh, fourth at the fountain which was extremely successful this year. Uh, we had a presence on the senior action days council along with the mayor. Uh, we participated this summer in summer reading programs where we had deputies reading to the kids over at the library. And we also do speaking engagements as requested. Uh, one of the things that comes along with preparing a PowerPoint, every time you go through it at the last minute, you notice things that you did not put on your PowerPoint. So I'd like to add that we will also have a presence at the Make a Difference Day, which is also on October 28th. So we will have some Great. deputies out there uh, contributing and giving back to the community and improving the quality of life for our, our residents. Next, I would like to talk about our calls for service. What you see before you is a uh, chart documenting all of the calls for service that are received from citizens in Fountain Hills. So you'll see the first column is the year 2014, the second column is 2015, the third column is 2016, and 2017 is a projected number based on our current calls for service through September 30th. So if we continue uh, with the regularity that we've had, that's what we anticipate the number of calls for service from our citizens will be. The next slide concerns our top 10 calls for service. Um, some of these are uh, time intensive, and so we, when we respond to calls like this, these are the calls that take the most of our time from our regular patrol activities. As you can see, our top three calls for service in 2017 and these are real-time numbers as of September 30th. There are false burglar alarms, welfare checks, and audible burglar alarms. If we continue on that track, we're probably going to have over 800 false burglar alarms that we'll respond to this year. This next slide are our top 10 report types. These are the reports that we most often take, and as you can see, Vehicle crash without injuries is number one. That's 107 crashes that we've taken with no injury in the town of Fountain Hills. So obviously traffic enforcement is an issue. Uh, traffic violations. So when we stop somebody and they commit a misdemeanor or felony offense and a report's required to be written, we have written 41 of those reports. And then you can go down the list. Um, of significance are our thefts. Uh, 78 is the number through the end of September. Frauds, assaults, these are misdemeanor assaults that are usually, in, in my opinion, have been domestic related or otherwise suspect known to victim. Uh, to my knowledge, we have very few uh, assault cases where the suspect does not know the perpetrator in some way, shape, or form or have a relationship. <clears throat> 
The death investigations were currently at 28 and identity theft is another issue here in town and we're currently at 43. Identity theft uh, differs from some of the other issues. Identity theft is taking the identity of another and we get confused with credit card fraud, which is not identity theft. That falls into the fraud category. Our total reports, these are the number of reports that are actually written by our patrol deputies. Uh, it works, the, the uh, chart works the same way from 2014 to 2017. 2017 is a projected number uh, through the end of this calendar, or the end of this calendar year, we'll write over 1,100 reports. This slide, I think, speaks to what our activity actually is as far as the patrol deputies here in town. Uh, 2014, I think our data collection was lacking, obviously, because we had, I know we had arrests in 2014. Um, 2016, we had 60 arrests, and so far through 2017, we have 76 arrests. That's 76 arrests through the end of September. I think that speaks volumes to the amount of investigative work being done here in town, and I'll highlight some of those cases uh, towards the end of my presentation. Our citations, we are currently at 894 citations through the end of September. We are projected to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,200 traffic tickets uh, for the town of Fountain Hills. Uh, with warnings, we're also looking in the neighborhood of the high 800s with warnings. When it comes to traffic enforcement, there's the three E's. There's engineering, there's education, and then there's enforcement. I prefer to do the education uh, portion of it where we get out and we educate people on what the traffic laws are, what the speed limits are. Um, as a last resort, enforcement is, is the option. Um, as you can see, or you may have seen, uh, with your support, we were able to reach a, uh, recently purchase a speed data trailer. And I want to emphasize it's a data collection tool. It is not a photo radar. It is not a license plate reader. It's not any of those big brother types of equipment. Mm -hmm. um, what it does for me uh, is it allows when we receive a complaint of a traffic issue on a residential street or on one of the major arterial streets, we can put the, the trailer out there and measure data. Uh, the data that we get from that system tells us the volume of traffic by the hour. It tells us the average speed. It tells us when we have a propensity for speeding and when people follow the rules. So when we take the enforcement step and I try to use my resources as best I can, Instead of having a deputy sit at one location for six hours running radar, I can have them out there for an hour during our high problem times, and that's what this trailer does for us. It's also a multi-use trailer that uh, Director Weldy will be using for public works, and when we have these events in town, we can program the screen for messages to direct people to parking, uh, directional information how to get out of town uh, so that we can try to eliminate some of these traffic backups that we have when we have events here at the fountain. Finally on this page is our crash reports. These are reported vehicle accidents that we are dispatched to. Uh, the number is 137 through the end of September. As we mentioned on a slide earlier, we've taken 107 of those reports. Some of those are non-reportable accidents. If you backed into a fixed object and the only thing that's damaged is your car, uh, you may opt to not have us take a police report and just correct the damage yourself. This next slide is the Uniform Crime Report. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is the level playing field that all municipalities use to measure and assess whether or not we have a crime issue here in town. These crimes, you take the total number of crimes, so in the, the top portion you'll see burglaries, thefts, auto thefts, and arsons. What you do is you take the total number of crimes, and so far through 2017 we have 190 crimes that have been reported, and you divide that into the population, and it gives us a crimes per thousand people of 7.6 crimes per person. The bottom half are all your violent crimes with homicide, sexual assault, robbery, and aggravated assault. Uh, our violent crime rate is currently 0.6. That means we have one six tenths of one violent crime per 1,000 residents here in town. Compared to other municipalities, and I'll use the 2016 data, last year we had 7.9 uh, was our number for property crimes and 0.8 for violent crimes. 
The city of Chandler was 2.2 for violent crimes. The city of Mesa was 4.3 for violent crimes. The city of Scottsdale was 1.5, and the city of Tempe was 4.8. Only Queen Creek and Gilbert were less than one. In terms of property crimes, and this is significant, last year our property crime rate was 7.9. The city of Chandler's property crime rate was 24.6 property crimes per thousand residents. The city of Gilbert was 13.9 crimes per thousand residents. The city of Mesa was 23.7. City of Scottsdale was 23.2. And city of Tempe was 44.8. As you can see, although we strive and we work very hard to get our numbers as close to zero as we possibly can, compared to the other municipalities, we are still the, one of the most safe communities in the Phoenix metropolitan area. And I think it's important to highlight that. Lastly, what I'd like to do is give you a couple of updates on some of the major cases that we've been working on. As you know, we had a strong arm robbery recently at the subway at Shea and Saguaro. That was a string, in fact, we were the fourth robbery of that string that night with the same suspects. The first one started around 7.15 in the evening in the city of Chandler. At eight o'clock, they hit a subway in the city of Gilbert. At 8.45, they hit the subway at the Loop 101 and 90th Street, which is ironically very close to the Scottsdale Police Department headquarters. And then they came down Shea Boulevard and hit our subway. We are currently working with those agencies as well as having the FBI's Violent Crimes Task Force consulting on it so we can develop information and get that crime solved as soon as reasonably possible. Those kind of things have an impact on the feeling of security in town, and I want you all to know that we take those types of crimes very seriously and we put those at the top of our list of things to do. I am quite confident that that crime will be successfully concluded with an arrest. During the time of August and September, we had two suspects, a male and a female, that stole more than $3,000 worth of electronics from the Target store by using an unknown cutting tool to cut security cables from the displays. As a part of our investigation, we found that these two, same two suspects hit that same target on five different occasions. So when you look at the numbers of thefts, that's, those are the type of crimes that drive our numbers up. As we looked at those cases, we found that those same two suspects were also hitting a target in the city of Tempe. We developed information and put out a, a BOLO flyer or be on the lookout flyer uh, to all of the agencies within the valley. Within a day or two, we were notified by the Tohota Odom Police Department that is in charge of security at the West Valley Casino over there by the football stadium that those two suspects were inside the casino. They detained those suspects based on our flyer and notified our detectives right away. And we were able to obtain full confessions to those crimes and we booked both of those individuals for that organized retail theft. The side effect of that was also we gave that same information to the Tempe Police Department and they were ultimately able to clear their cases and charge those suspects with additional retail crime thefts. This is the biggie, <clears throat> the home invasion we had in July. I want to reiterate, we've only had one home invasion in Fountain Hills this calendar year. In July, two suspects entered the victim's home with the intent to commit a burglary. Three victims were corralled into a bathroom and tied up. One of the suspects, who was armed with a handgun, pistol whipped the male victim, causing minor injury. The suspects fled the residence in one of the victim's vehicles and abandoned it approximately a half mile from the scene. A citizen who wished not to be identified provided information leading to the arrest of our first suspect. We recovered some of the items that were stolen from that burglary as a result of contacting that suspect. That suspect gave us a full accounting of what occurred during that home invasion, which led us to our second suspect. Our second suspect knew that we had contacted the first and booked him into jail, and that suspect fled to the city of Denver, Colorado. Working with the 
FBI Fugitive Task Force, we were able to ha have that subject taken into custody in Denver and brought back on probation violation charges, where we ultimately had the opportunity to sit and talk with him, which he surrendered no new additional information. He's currently sitting in jail uh, with eight felony charges uh, pending trial. As a part of this particular investigation, we looked at some burglaries that occurred at the same time to see if there were any similarities. There was a burglary that was reported that same day that as a result of the investigation turned out to actually be an insurance fraud that was reported as a burglary. We were able to clear that case out as well as charge those two suspects with the insurance fraud. So when we look at the crimes that occur in town, we look for those patterns and we try to link them together. Uh, although this one was not specifically linked, um, it's part of the investigative process that we do that helps us clear these other crimes. Earlier in the year prior to my arrival as a district captain, uh, we had two separate robberies at the Circle K. Uh, each Circle K in town was robbed by a crew of two males and one female. They hopped the counter, stole cigarettes, alcohol, and lottery tickets. Uh, we did quickly determined that that was a series, just like the Subway series that we're currently investigating, that involved multiple agencies. Working with those other agencies, we developed leads and collected evidence uh, that led to the identification and arrest of the three suspects. One of the suspects we were just notified has recently pled guilty to armed robbery and kidnapping, which is resulting in a 10-year prison sentence. And lastly, the last case I'd like to discuss is our arson death investigation that occurred in the 14,600 block of Yerba Buena. Our arson unit has concluded that that fire was intentionally set by the victim. The medical examiner has not determined a manner of death as of yet, and so it's undetermined, but has determined that the cause of death was smoke inhalation, so we know that the victim was breathing at the time of the fire. This investigation continues to be ongoing. Uh, when I spoke to the homicide investigator, there was, to his knowledge, no evidence of any impairment or um, incapacitation that would render the victim unable to escape the fire. Um, so we're still looking at a couple of things, but we're, we are confident that the victim may have set that fire himself. At that point, this concludes my presentation, and I open it up for discussion, questions, anything. Well, thank you. That was a great presentation. I know that our residents are always asking us, you know, um, what are the police doing? Are there a lot of arrests? What's going on in our community? And this is certainly uh, a great presentation to show everybody how hard your guys are out there working. Um, and I think they're going to be very surprised, too. I mean, I'm surprised that, that most of our major crime is a series that comes from, like, the subway. You know, it's outsiders doing the crime, and then they hit one place, and then they hit another. So, I mean, I think it's, it's a little bit comforting to know that it's not people from town that are actually doing this. It's mostly outsiders. Not that that's going to help us any, but it still is. It's good to know that uh, the people here are not involved in that kind of crime, except for some of it. Right. The serial crimes are opportunistic. Yeah. So they decide, you know, tonight we're going to mm -hmm. hit Subways or McDonald's or yeah. KFCs, and, and they just drive around, and as they see them, they, right. they perpetrate their crimes. Yeah. And then, and then there's all cameras in these stores, so usually then you just get the, the, that, that's the, correct. the cameras, and then you can find them. That's correct. It's a good thing they're not that smart either. <laughs> um, I just have one question about the, um, about the warnings. I know uh, people are going to wonder why do you give so many warnings. Do you usually, is it the first stop that someone would get a warning and then if they're a repeat customer they wouldn't? How does that work? Well, I, I think each individual deputy kind of establishes a threshold as to what's acceptable. So what I would tell you is if the speed limit on Saguaro is 35, 36 miles an hour is too fast. As a general rule, you do have a little leeway, um, but I think it's up to the individual deputy's discretion whether or not he wants to have an educational contact or if he wants to issue a citation. 
I do want to state that when you are stopped by a deputy, just so everybody understands this process, everyone will receive some type of piece of paper. It will either be a vehicle stop contact form, or we call it a receipt, uh, verifying the officer's name. So if there's ever any question which deputy stopped you, you should have that information. It will either be a warning or it'll be a citation. Uh, and that's just another uh, one of those things that has come out of the, the federal court order that we're, we are required to do. The upside to all of that is our data collection is becoming significantly better. That's why I think you'll see, uh, if you go back and look at some of the slides when you have time, you'll see some of the numbers are up. Thefts were up a little bit, but burglaries are down, auto thefts are down. That's that more accurate data collection that's come out of our improved databases that are constantly being updated and improved. Um, that's a, a huge benefit to me as a commander when I'm trying to assign my limited resources as to where we're going to put people to patrol in town. Uh, we try to identify those hot spots and put those people in those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So let's say you, your deputy stops someone on a local street because people say, oh, they're always speeding on the street. And you stop someone and you give them a warning. Um, then the same person is stopped a second time. Would that be on the record then that you could look up and see that they already got one warning and maybe you wouldn't give them a second? How does that work? We, we could look it up. It's, it's information that's at our fingertips in the cars now. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, if you've already received a warning and you're in the same location doing the same thing, uh, you most likely will get a citation. Okay. You most likely will get a citation. Okay. Questions? Councilman Vice Mayor? All right. Councilman Yates. Um, tremendous presentation, thank you. I'm, I'm always big to see if there's any trends, and I know it's not necessarily seasonal, it's opportunistic, like you said. Let's go a different direction. Do you have any crime prevention tips you can share with us coming into the season in general or seasonal? Uh, you know, here, here's the, the general rule of thumb. As a community, we need to help each other out, and we need to look out for each other. Make sure you're locking things up. Make sure you're securing your vehicles at night when you're in the carport. Make sure your garage doors are closed. Make sure you're not sharing personal information over the telephone with people that you do not know. Um, you know, the list can go on and on and on. At the end of the day, as your police commander, I am ultimately responsible for the enforcement activities here in town. But here's what I want to emphasize, and I preach this to my staff all the time, the power of we, meaning not just MCSO, it's the folks sitting on the dais tonight that give direction to us about how they want the town enforced. It's the folks that live in town, give direction and, and ultimately decide how we are going to control crime in this town. Simply seeing something and saying so, if you see something that's out of the ordinary and strange, please call us. We would rather come over there and respond to one of these calls, uh, the false burglar alarms or the suspicious activity, but at least it gives us some idea. And when they see, when you take the time to call and we respond to that area to deal with that call for service, if somebody is watching or they are quote unquote casing a home, they'll see us respond to that neighborhood. And what they know is people in this neighborhood pay attention, we need to move to another neighborhood. And if the whole town could come together and support each other, you know your neighbors, you know what kind of cars they drive, you know if they're having a barbecue or if they're out of town for a week, mm -hmm. call us. I would rather, you know, 30 years I've been in this business, every time I've actually gotten a call for a burglary in progress and I showed up and somebody was actually there, it was the neighbor who was checking on the neighbor's house that the other neighbor didn't know. And I'd rather have that situation than not get the phone call and somebody comes back from a fabulous vacation and finds their side garage door kicked in and their TV missing. We would like that information shared with us. Um, it does no good to, to share that information on social media or text your friends in the neighborhood. You need to let us know. What that allows me to do when I look at my uh, enforcement process and I decide where I'm going to allocate my resources, that's the data I use to go and assign deputies to a specific neighborhood. We just had a discussion with some of our supervisors. We have three relatively new sergeants that are assigned here in Fountain Hills. Solid people, very smart but still learning that process uh, of assigning their people where they need to be. So we just had that discussion about how we prioritize and how we assign our resources. But the biggest crime tip I can tell you is if something just feels weird and we all have that gut feeling, call us. It, it costs you nothing. We're already here. 
please take advantage of the fact that we are your law enforcement agency. And since you mentioned calling, let me just ask this. Would you advise people to call, to dial 911, or if it's during the week and you're in the office, should they call directly to the office? Calling to the office, there's a slight delay. Uh, we will route you to the main dispatch center. So the mm -hmm. best thing you can do is call our main dispatch line. That's the quickest way to get a deputy to respond. So there is a bit of a delay. Um, so I would recommend calling the 602-876-1011 or 1030, okay. uh, the non-emergency. But obviously, if you mm -hmm. see something and you feel it rises to the level of an emergency, please call 911. Okay. Vice Mayor? Thank you. That's outstanding uh, presentation and very illuminating. Um, the public probably doesn't know that whenever there's uh, an incident, fire or police, that the council gets notified almost immediately by text. And it has seemed lately like there's been more than usual. And my, my wife said to me just the other day, we're not a sleepy little town anymore. But then I looked at your statistics and I was very surprised because it looks like there's been a lot of progress and that for a lot of the categories, the number of incidents has ac actually been reduced. Correct. Um, so I, I congratulate you on that. Um, I want to follow up on uh, a question the mayor asked uh, and that was or mentioned, which is uh, sort of homegrown versus people coming in from other areas. Um, if you look at the most serious uh, kinds of incidents, um, assault, uh, theft, murder, things like that, can you give us any sense as to what percentage are coming are, are from our homegrown versus coming in from other areas? Like I said, uh, most of our assaults are relationship-based, um, whether they be domestic, whether they be friends. Um, I don't see, like you won't go to the neighborhood um, eatery establishment and it breaks out into a bar fight and there's 50 people fighting. That, that just doesn't happen in this town, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, I, I can say one of the violent crimes that concerns me a little bit were the sexual assault numbers. I mean, five is a pretty significant number. I can tell you that two of those cases are classified as sexual assaults, but what they really boil down to is age of consent issues, um, where the one perpetrator is, you know, in their early 20s and they're in a relationship with a 16-year-old, which by law they can't grant consent, so that falls into the sexual assault category. So. Sometimes those numbers are a bit misleading and I wanna be sure to let everyone know that we don't have those kind of significant issues here in town. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councilman Leger. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> so how long have you been with us? Six months? Six months. You've been busy. <laughs> <laughs> it's not me, it's the people that work here. I, I just direct the activity. You and your team has been, have been busy and you've done, you've done an extraordinary job, so thank you for that service. Um, one thing I really appreciate is your turnaround of information that you get to the town manager who in turn turns that around to council members. That's very much appreciated because when things happen, you know, social media lights up and there's all kinds of information and misinformation and oftentimes as council folks we get calls, we bump into people at Safeway, et cetera. So it's it's nice to have that information come pretty quickly when it's available to the town manager to council members. And of course, that's not something I share, but at least we have that particular information. So thank you for that. One question I think I had asked the town manager earlier in the year, and I think he spoke to you about it. It seemed for a, a bit of time there, we just had an inordinate amount of suicides um, in this town, which was just that, that, that really, dis really disturbing. Correct. Uh, that is a true statement. Uh, last year in 2016, we had one suicide in the town of Fountain Hills. To date, I think we, that number is at six. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and it's a bit alarming. I think it's a statement um, about the state of the world today, sure. in my opinion, because there's no correlation between it. Uh, what I can say is depression has no face. Uh, I think we've seen a number of celebrities recently who've committed suicide mm -hmm. that seemingly have everything that they've ever yeah. wanted or needed, and they have committed suicide. Yeah. Um, I, I wish I could give you a, a clear defining answer on why that's occurring, um, but I can't. Yes, and I, w I didn't expect that. Maybe it's something we could look at in terms of uh, resources or a public information person or communicate that via 
um, our website or, or channel 11. Um, there are a number of community resources out there. But nonetheless, uh, superb job and thank you. Appreciate it. One, one of the things we, we hear about all the negatives that occur in town and what we do as a law enforcement agent is sometimes we don't take advantage of our wins. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thankful for the opportunity tonight to come here and speak with you all to tell you about what we are actually doing because I think it sends the proper message that even though some things are occurring or they're out of the norm, we are taking effective enforcement action here in town. Well, well done to you and your team. Thank you. Thank you. Any other councilmen? Councilman Brown? Thank you, Mayor. Captain, uh, great report. As, as we've all mentioned, a wonderful report, and thank you for it. And I've heard about all the questions that I would have asked, and I just want to simply thank you and your staff for the service that you provide for our town. Thank you. Well, thank you. Okay. Anything else? Mayor, could they repeat that number to call? Oh, could you repeat the uh, local yes. number? Yes. Uh, it's either 602 876 one zero one one or one zero three zero and nine one one obviously when all else fails that's probably the one to go with okay anything else grady uh thank you mayor um as the captain's presentation uh showed i think that we get as taxpayers and as um, elected officials here in town can see a very good value um, for the money that's spent here on law enforcement. MCSO really has uh, a great resources and really provide, I think, an incredible service to our community. Um, I also wanted to, and I'm not trying to embarrass him, but we have Executive Chief Matt Giordano here tonight, and if he might want to just Stole come my quickly. thunder. I was going to so, have him come Oh, sorry, up. Mayor. No, I didn't know okay. if anybody else had seen him. This, yes. this wasn't a part of my plan, though. I had that written down. I was going to bring you up. Mm -hmm. Mayor, Town Council, thanks for having me here today. Uh, I just wanted to come and support Captain Brandemort. Um, I know when I spoke with several of you when we were making a change, I think it was six months ago now, uh, there was some apprehension. Uh, things were going smoothly, and no one likes to upset the apple cart, but I think you'll see and, and see what we saw in Hank, and we knew he'd be a great addition to the town, and, and we're, we just couldn't be more pleased with the relationship that we've, we've been able to foster over the past uh, 10 months of Sheriff Penzone's uh, uh, position as sheriff. Okay. Thank you very much All for right. having me. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we also have Deputy Fisher in the back, who is always with us, who's always here for our <laughs> meetings, and who's always makes himself available, which we really do appreciate. He's a familiar face, and we know we can we can talk to him about anything. So thank you for always being here, Deputy Fisher. And he always has a smile on his face, Mary. He does. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like he knows the joke that no one knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anything else from Council? Councilman Tolis, did you have something? Well, I just say great job. Okay. I, I really appreciate how visible you are in the community. And uh, when you do the coffees at Starbucks, uh, there's always a good showing. And, I think that's just so important that the kids of the community are comfortable and they're willing to share with you if they know of anything at the high school level and even younger. And I just wanted to bring up the text -to tip program and maybe you can also put on record the text -to tip and how that works so that the community can make a note of that as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the text -to tip program is an app that you can download to your phone. Uh, and it allows you to anonymously send us information if there's activity occurring or you know the guy down the street is uh, potentially selling drugs to kids, but you know, no one wants to be the guy that has to go to court. So you can provide that information to us. We do a little research into it, and then we decide whether or not it's an issue that we investigate or not investigate based on what we find. Um, but it's completely anonymous. You do it from your phone. Um, Chief, correct me if I'm wrong, I think at some point in the very near future, we may actually have the ability to text our dispatchers. Um, I know that's some technology that's in the works. I don't know where we are with that process. But again, as technology improves, it improves the level of communication between our citizens and the police department. And I will tell you that, like I said earlier, the power of we, we collectively make this a safe community. I just put together the enforcement directives but the citizens are the ones that give us the information and help us police their community. Without their support and without their information, there's not a lot we can do to 
effectively put together a, a plan that reduces crime in the neighborhoods. Okay. Anything else? Right. And I know a resource officer is not here, but he did attend the coalition meeting and introduced himself to everyone at the coalition and talked about the school and his plans for helping out there. It sounds just awesome what he's doing. I think Correct. he's just a perfect fit for that job. I, I've, I've gotten some positive feedback from mm -hmm. Dr. Sweeney. Yeah. Uh, I'm encouraged. He's got a lot of good ideas. The, mm -hmm. A fresh a uh, set of eyeballs on a problem yeah. that um, mm -hmm. he can help resolve. So that's been a good, a good change okay. also. Um, Anything else? I want to clap for him. Okay, you can clap for him. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. It's always, a, it, it's truly been a privilege to serve up here and I'm, I'm flattered by the level of support that I received from the council as well as the community. Uh, Lieutenant Johnson, his first week here, everywhere we went, somebody came up and said thank you or how much they appreciated us. And so he said to me at the end of the week with a big grin on his face, when does the other shoe drop? <laughs> and I said, that's how we know we're doing a good job. When people come up and they're willing to tell us that they have, we have their support. When they stop talking to us, that's when we have problems. So I just wanted to share how much I appreciate the opportunity to serve in the community. Great. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, Chief. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. All right. Call to the public. Any speaker cards? No speakers. Nothing on the agenda. Okay. Now let's go to our consent agenda. We have eight, and I would like a motion to accept as written. So moved. In a second. Okay. And can we have a roll call vote, please? Vice Mayor Magazine? Aye. Councilmember Leger? Aye. Councilmember Tolis? Aye. Councilmember Yates? Aye. Councilmember Brown? Aye. And Mayor Kavanaugh? Aye. Mayor 6 0. Okay, going on to a regular agenda, I just want to first make an announcement that if anybody's here for number 10, uh, which was the abandonment, uh, that has been postponed, uh, and that was postponed at the request of the HOA. So we will bring that back at another time. For right now, we have number nine, discussion with possible direction to staff regarding the open versus closed status of the technology drive gate. Grady? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, um, you'll recall back in March, this item came before the Council and there was a um, majority of the council voted to actually conduct a traffic count. Um, that traffic count was um, for 90 days, 45 days with the gate closed and 45 days with the gate open. Um, actually, I said that in the reverse order, but it, it, it still works out to be the same. <laughs> Anyways, um, we had all the uh, compilation of the data that occurred, um, I believe, late last week and um, our town engineer is going to go ahead and give a report to the council on this. And we've also, I believe in front of you, you'll see that there are um, some aerials that kind of show the before and after, the before target and after target. So you can see um, the abandonment of, of um, laser and some of the realignment um, of some of the streets. So our town engineer will go ahead and, and get started on that. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, on March 2nd, the town council directed staff to count and study traffic in the vicinity of the technology drive gate, uh, both with that gate open and closed. The existing gate on technology drive was installed by the uh, Four Peaks Plaza developer, the Barclay Group, and uh, it was per the town council stipulations for that project. Since its initial construction, the technology drive gate has been unsatisfactory to various business owners, uh, has been uh, unsatisfactory to business owners on Technology Drive and in the Laser Drive area since that gate can make access to their businesses more difficult. Conversely, various residents and the HOAs are consistently favored the gate remaining closed due to their concerns about headlights, noise, traffic volume, and safety. This is our traffic count map, and you can see the, uh, the number one is, is where we had set traffic counters. Um, we had uh, counts at those lo three locations. Uh, actually, there's two right together on there on Saguaro. Um, and the gate was in its normally closed position for 45 days while we counted, and then for 45 days with the gate open. 
um, after we finished the, uh, uh, the counts, the gate was returned to its normally closed position. This is a, a graph of our uh, uh, hourly traffic distribution, and um, we, we took this on a Friday for, uh, since that's our, our peak traffic day of the week. And you can see um, the difference um, between the traffic um, both on the alley and on the technology drive. So with the gate open, the uh, traffic increased on, uh, uh, on technology and decreased in the alley. The peak was about uh, 13 vehicles an hour. Um, this is the uh, uh, graph of our uh, total traffic volume uh, per day. Uh, and again, we, we, took, we took this uh, for presentation purposes on a Friday, but the, the other days are similar. So you can see in the green that the uh, uh, traffic uh, went up about 102 vehicles a day on technology and uh, went down on the alley, um, dropped a little bit on Saguaro, probably mostly due to the uh, uh, um, getting closer to summer rather than the, to the gate being open. Um, I would note that uh, uh, although we don't have a slide for it, the overnight traffic volume from, uh, from 10 um, p.m. to uh, 5 a.m. Um, is very, very low, both with the gate open and with the uh, gate closed. Uh, this, this slide shows uh, the, uh, the traffic that diverted from the, uh, um, from the alley onto uh, Technology Drive. Um, it was fairly consistent over uh, uh, the various days of the week, and uh, the, uh, the, the colored range is, is how it ranged over the uh, six weeks that we took uh, traffic volumes. This shows uh, some of our uh, um, design considerations. Uh, all the traffic flows are well below the town's design target volumes, uh, except for the alley with the gate close where that design target volume was very slightly exceeded. Um, truck traffic volume was very light on all the study locations in both counts and really didn't divert significantly, so we haven't really shown that. Um, I know the council has received a number of letters regarding the uh, open versus closed status of the technology <coughs> gate, um, and I would note that there have been no reported accidents at any of these study-related intersections during the past four years. Um, Staff recommendation on this. Um, this is one of those true council policy decision, and uh, therefore staff will, will defer to the town council's decision. There really is no overriding engineering or safety consideration to the gate status uh, either way. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'm presuming you have a number of speaker cards. Mm -hmm. Questions? Councilman Leger? Randy, thanks for the presentation. Uh, just, just a couple of items. <clears throat> we keep referring to um, the alley. Uh, for years, we've been calling it the alley. How do you define an alley? Um, I'm calling it an alley because that's uh, what, how, what it's shown as on the, uh, on the plat map for that plat. It's, uh, it's shown as an alley on the plat map. Um, in effect, it is uh, um, slightly smaller than our uh, standard street width. It's, uh, very similar to our hillside local road uh, width, uh, but it is paved, it does have curbs, um, just slightly smaller than most of our other streets. It's, it's my understanding that it's, it's 28, 28 feet wide. Mayor Councilman, yes it is, uh, and, and we always measure back to back a curb, so yes it is. Is that from the end of the curb? That, that's from the back side of the curb. The back side of the curb, because they are like drainage and they're, they're flat, so it's the backside of the curve, okay. Um, no accidents in that area? Uh, we didn't have any accidents in the last four years at any of our study uh, intersection locations. So it's, it's paved, it's 28 feet wide. Um, there are other alleys in town um, that are just about wide enough for one vehicle, so that's why I asked the question, why do we keep referring to it? As, as an alley. Um, thank you for that. It's my understanding that you have some uh, aerial photo photographs of the area. <clears throat> I, 
I had requested these, and um, I would like you, if you could, to go through them. Um, I'd like to put this issue to, to bed once and for all. Um, and um, a lot of folks will say, a gate, why is there a gate there? How did a gate get there? And I think it's important to hear from you because you've been here, the history. Um, so I know that you have a uh, topographical view of uh, the area prior to Target and after Target. And if you could contrast the differences and what was the rationale and or the objective for council making a policy decision to put a gate in that particular area. And I can repeat those as we go along. Thank you. Um, Bev, I may mean, need some help. It's uh, showing on my screen. But, uh... Mike. <laughs> Mayor. Vice Mayor. Uh, while we're waiting. You want to fix it? <laughs> oh, yeah, you got the right one. <laughs> um, while we're waiting, I, um, I wondered about this alley that I kept hearing about. Honestly, I didn't know what it was. So I went over and decided to take uh, some photographs which I want to just, and I think it might help the whole council to see what this looks like. I've been on the alley. I think most of us have, the, have been on the alley. This is two vehicles. Uh, it shows yeah. a lot of space between the two vehicles. <clears throat> mm -hmm. to, me, I mean, to me, this looks like a road, but. Just for clarification, you, you, all of these uh, tests that you did, you could tell the difference between a truck, a car, right? Yes, Mayor, we can. Yeah. In fact, we can tell the difference between uh, um, how many axles a truck has, for example, and a mo differentiated motorcycle, that type of thing. Um, I didn't give any uh, graphics on that ex at all because it really didn't look like the uh, truck traffic really changed much. Okay. This is the next Okay. I guess you got your... Yeah, this is a... This is an exhibit, and I uh, apologize for it not uh, showing very well, but uh, it shows. <coughs> can you get a laser pointer? Yes. Can, can I ask clarification from sure. Alan from Kong? Absolutely. Okay. This picture you just gave us, this is the next street up, correct, from where the gate is? So if you continue to go south and then you take that right hand turn there's an auto body in the corner there and the, uh, there's a repair shop right in the corner yeah. yeah so the when you're referring to the alley my understanding when we went through this conversation before is if you take that turn and then you take the immediate following right hand turn that's the alley we're talking about is that isn't that correct uh, mayor council member um, no, um, this is Technology Drive right here. Um, the gate is down off the map down here. Uh, the alley is over here to the west, and I'm not really seeing it, but it's, it's over here to the west. There is a, another alley that goes this way. Um, yeah, so the whole discussion, the, the whole issue really is, so here, Let's see, I, we get the lights in the back, it's hard to see with the yeah. glare. But you're coming down here, you pass where you have this gate, you come back, you take that right hand turn, and then you come down the side of the buildings over here, which is how anyone that's local would do this because they know it's there, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, so if you're not local, you come down this road, you see this gate, and you say, oh, I can't get in this way. And then you turn around, and you go back up Saguaro, and you come down technology over here. <clears throat> right? Thank you, my Baroness. Yeah, here's the app. Right. So what's, is this a road? No, no. It's, it's, I, don't, I don't think there's 
just step by it. SRP. Yeah. Randy, can that image be expanded? Because it's cutting off the, yeah. the southern portion of the. Yeah. 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 Disappeared. Are we talking about the turn by the SRP, Randy? Are we are we talking about the the turn by the SRP? Um, yes, Mary, yes. Yes. Okay. That, I mean, that's the big landmark there that everybody knows. Ready to go, Jason? You just uh, lost the screen again. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they're both considered. Yeah, I took the wrong. I thought that both of those roads are. I know that I went out there. Also. I went out there also. I I didn't even realize this one went all the way through. So, so there you see the. I didn't realize that one there goes all the way through. There you see the gate. Um, over here is the alley that uh, Councilman Tullis was referring to. Um, and then there's uh, um, Blazer Drive. And did, I, did I get to the two part of the east? But anyway, yeah, there's, there's a series of other streets. There's, there's a back way into that area. Um, but uh, Technology Drive is the, uh, the, the wider street and the more direct route um, for anyone coming in uh, this way. Uh, certainly, uh, residents in this area can, can use the, uh, the alley as a background. Here, if I may. So, Randy, this is, if I'm looking at the correct slide, um, this should be the aerial photography from um, prior to Target, correct? That's correct. So, could you um, illustrate for the general public what streets were available before they were abandoned? behind Target, because I think the genesis of the gate is directly correlated to the abandonment of, of laser as it comes off of Saguaro. Can you point that out? Uh, there are a number of rights of way on here that were actually not paved, but the, the rights of way are shown. Um, but Laser Drive uh, did continue from technology all the way down to Saguaro prior to the Target Center. Uh, with the Target Center, um, this piece of laser drive has now become a, a, a drainage channel. Okay. Um, these other rights away, the rights away were there, but there was actually oh, no yes, yeah. access through them. So, so Mayor, if I may, so basically when laser drive was abandoned, um, from reading the council notes that engaged in this policy, the concern was <coughs> that traffic from Saguaro now was pushed into the residential area into technology to access Laser Drive. And it's my understanding historically from talking to folks that have businesses back there, that there was a time when Laser was there, that was their direct route off of Saguaro. Do you recall that, Dennis? I hear you saying yes, okay. So, that, to me, answers the question why the gate's there, and just in terms of the genesis of the gate. And it didn't just, it just, it didn't appear. It was a stipulation. It was a council decision uh, to, to do so. Would you mind now taking us to the post-target slide? Hopefully. <laughs> okay. Okay, Mike. He's already coming. <laughs> the heck? Yep. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So this this slide shows the uh, the target center in place. Uh, this is a, a current aerial photo. You can see the gate there. Um, so uh, laser drive is now a drainage channel through here. 
can you um, move, Mayor, if I may, could you move up to Shea Boulevard and, and show us the gateway to the industrial center? Okay, Mike, you can just take this. No, I don't think I can. <laughs> well, you should be able to because I have it on my, my slide here. Um, Okay, thank you. Now that you have that up there, um, and once again, sorry that it's taken so much time, but as I said, over the years we've been asked a lot of questions, and I think it's important historically to understand how the decision was made to gate technology. So what did, when you're looking at Shea and technology, was that there before? Uh, Mayor Councilman Leger, um, no, the, uh, uh, this section of technology from um, the alley north of Laser uh, was not constructed until uh, it was constructed as a part of the target center. And there is currently a traffic signal at uh, the intersection of Shea and uh, technology. Okay, so the rationale for that particular road as it read in the development agreement was contingent on the gate being on technology, which would stop folks from getting into the industrial center and that this was intended to be the direct route to Laser Drive in the Industrial Center. I, I can't really speak to the intention, but uh, I can tell you that they were well, both the stipulations. The developer cars. spent millions of dollars to bring a road in there to, to move into, uh, to address the issue that the business owners had. Um, their, their issues were not, were not ignored at the time, so. Thank you, and I do have one other question regarding the alley. Um, that we've all kind of figured out where it is now as Mayor uh, referred to the SRP alley. You mentioned that the traffic count was 312 and it exceeded the standard criteria of 300. Yes, sir. Is that correct? Yes. So that would mean that in a 24-hour period, there's a half of a car over or a car over every two hours. So is that, from a traffic engineering perspective, is that a serious uh, safety concern? It's really insignificant. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, Council, for bearing with me. Madam Mayor. Councilman Yates. From what my history lesson was also, um, from what I understood, I'll being completely empathetic with the idea that we don't want um, an abundance of uh, road traffic going on in any residential. Um, but it was my understanding that the <laughs> gate was put up as a stipulation in the event there was excessive traffic. Um, Mayor, Councilman Yates, uh, the, uh, the, the gate was a stipulation of the target center. There wasn't any spe specification as to um, why. why or, <laughs> um, and, and I think that was, uh, um, it was actually, it wasn't a, a staff recommended stipulation, it was actually added by the council. Madam Mayor, if I may. Um, so based on the study, two things. One is, is a 90 day study, is that accurate? Was that enough time to get a feel for what the situation is? Uh, Councilman Yates, uh, um, that's actually much, much longer than we ever do traffic studies okay. for. Okay, right. I appreciate <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, so it's a, uh, very accurate. Uh, and, and I'm not trying to pigeonhole you at all, because again, I'm very cognizant. I, I wouldn't want uh, necessarily uh, um, traffic on my street um, uh, more than, than what's normal or than what's capacity. But I also noticed, let's talk about capacity. The study did reveal that maybe at or around a little over 700 cars per day are in that general area, and the, the roads are capacity have 7,000. So we're about a tenth of what it can handle. Is that a fair statement? Uh, Councilman Yates, I wouldn't use the term capacity, I would use the term uh, our, our design uh, volume. Okay. Uh, um, 
<laughs> capacity has a different meaning in traffic engineering. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, our our, our, our design volumes uh, we are well within, well below the uh, design volume on these streets. Okay. And again, uh, Madam Mayor, if I may, again, completely empathetic. Open and close. It didn't seem that there was any significant change other than the alley just would absorb the additional traffic for the local folks, but when it's open, it, it just divided that. Councilman Yates, yes, I, that's, that's my uh, take on it, is basically some traffic shifted from the alley uh, to technology. And lastly, Mayor, <laughs> Henry, I'm, I'm one up and I apologize. Is, is 700 cars a day, I mean, let's say it was 800 cars a day, relative to this type of area and having a neighborhood and a commercial is that a high volume of cars you know as you could see from the one slide that uh, showed the uh, the target design volumes that we have uh, we're, we're well below them so you know we wouldn't you know, we, we have that kind of traffic all over town so is, do you feel that's high for this kind of area or low no, or I don't, I don't think it's excessively high okay thank you Mark. Councilman Thank you. It, is it uh, true that likely that this gate was put up to avoid uh, commercial trucks and things of that nature from Target going in and out and using that as an inlet outlet for their delivery trucks and things of that nature so that it forced them to come down Technology Drive? Uh, in to follow up, I think that's probably the case. And to follow up on that, I mean, it, it, can you tell from those traffic counts and the counters whether they're residential, whether they're cars or whether they're trucks that are down going back and forth? Is there any way to differentiate from the counter what it actually is? Yes, Mayor Councilman told us, yeah, we, we did actually have uh, truck counts and we can have it by axle and time of day. And I could have given you all those same um, graphs for trucks too, but what we found is there wasn't really any significant uh, shifting of trucks, uh, gate opener versus gate closed. And isn't it true, just for my clarification, don't we have signage right now on Saguaro coming off of Shea in a couple of different places that commercial trucks are not allowed to use that road? Um, I. I I can't speak to that. I don't recall, actually. So. Anybody know the answer to that? No? no, there's not. There's not. Okay. Vice Mayor? Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to come at this from a slightly different direction. Um, and I understand why there's uh, so much discussion about numbers of vehicles and, the, and how wide the roads are and so on, and I think that's all legitimate. Um, but at this point, I think we're starting to quibble a little bit over numbers. And we've heard that the numbers are not excessive in any way. In fact, they're far below um, what would be standard. Um, and what I'm about to say, I want to, I want to make this clear. This is not a political statement. It's just a statement of facts, as I know them, which is that a number of agreements uh, that have been made <coughs> within the United States, around the world, and so on, have been abrogated for a variety of reasons. And so the question has been raised by some as to whether or not, because of that, uh, folks, citizens, can depend upon those agreements when, in fact, they're abrogated. We have a situation here where uh, the citizens were told that they were going to be protected. And I admit that uh, a few uh, citizens might be inconvenienced, might have to go a few blocks out of their way, uh, and so on, but the numbers seem to be very low. And I think, I feel pretty strongly, we need to keep faith with the citizens. If it were a safety issue, I'd be looking at it differently. If we had statistics that showed there'd been accidents or anything like that, I'd say, okay, that has to come into play in our decision making. But what we heard is that there haven't been any in four years, is that correct, Randy? That's correct. So to me, it doesn't come down to uh, the numbers because the numbers seem reasonable. Um, it comes down to whether or not we keep faith with our citizens. Um, they were told that they would be protected, that there wouldn't be commercial traffic, that the gate would be closed. It was all part of a process. And in a sense, we're a continuing body. The council voted to put up the gate. 
Therefore, I think it's critically important that we continue to keep faith with our citizens. <coughs> because if we don't, we could have citizens in other parts of town uh, who want things done or had things done or whatever and start to wonder, uh, is the council, is the government going to renege on these promises? I think that's a very slippery slope that we don't want to be part of. Randy, uh, the counter that was on the alley, do we know if that was truck traffic or pedestrian or just cars? Uh, Mayor, uh, what <coughs> the way that we count vehicles, um, if we have one road tube out, we can only count the number of axles and divide by two. Um, in this case, we have two counters out there, so we can uh, classify <coughs> vehicles, not only, not only count the number of vehicles that we have, but we can also classify them by uh, how many axles they have, and um, also it can tell how far apart the axles are, and it can classify them whether it's a truck or a car or a motorcycle. So, so, so we have that data. So do we know? Eight inches high of it. Okay, so I'm just interested in knowing how many trucks versus how many cars are using the alley. And the only reason why I'm asking this is because if the homeowners are concerned about, about traffic going through there, okay, nobody has said anything to me about the alley. So if, let's say, the gate is open, then truck traffic goes through there. Let's say the gate is closed, then truck traffic still goes through and they use the alley. <coughs> they don't use the alley. Mayor. Okay, we'll let the engineer explain it. Yeah, um, I, I didn't give you a full presentation on the truck traffic because what we found okay. is that the truck traffic took the same routes they did um, after the gate was open as it did before the gate was open. So <coughs> it really didn't change. So are trucks using the alley or they're not? So, so there are some trucks using the alley. Uh -huh. um, there are some trucks using Saguaro. There, there really weren't any uh, significant amount of trucks using technology. <coughs> no change. Yeah. Okay. So you get what I'm saying. I'm saying, like, if you wanted to keep truck traffic out of that street because it's not only there that is a problem, but it's also the alley that's a problem. Because if you keep that gate <coughs> closed, then you could have trucks going through and using the alley, right? And then they're going past all the homes. Yeah, you know, you, you can have a truck going on any street that's open, so, yeah. <laughs> Except this one. Yeah, so I'm just, trying to, I'm just trying to figure out how do you solve this, um, because if either way, it seems like we have a problem with trucks are going to sneaking in, and unless it, the whole thing is signed, no truck traffic. <coughs> I mean, if we decided that the gate is closed, would our next step be to sign the road no truck traffic so they don't go through and use the alley? I mean, is that? Because I'm just saying, like, if, if, if the neighbors are, and they seem to be overly concerned, rightfully so, I mean, I went down there and met with some of them. Um, if they're concerned about that being open, if I lived there, I'd also be concerned about the alley being open because it's just, it's even going further into the neighborhood. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, Mayor, yes. I mean, if, if, if we would have found trucks shifting, you know, I would think mm -hmm. it would actually be uh, less detrimental to the neighborhood, except the people right, that are right there where they're making the turn. So if, if, if we decided that the, if the council voted that the gate should be closed, then they're saying, in essence, that they don't want truck traffic on that street, then shouldn't it be signed? for no truck traffic, so truck traffic doesn't go bypass the gate and use the alley, too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mayor, we, we certainly could do that. Um, uh, we'd have to look at our, um, our section of the town code as to where we have uh, truck routes, uh, but we, we certainly could do that. Okay, I think, Councilman Brown. Thank you, Mayor. So I've, I've had my storage unit back up at the very end of Laser Drive now for four or five years. So I'm in and out of the, that part of town quite often, several times a day. <coughs> and the amount of truck traffic that you get back in that area is minimal. And, but the biggest, the biggest point is that over the 15 years that we've had a Target Center and the gate's been there, 15 years, Henry, 
long time, everybody has been trained to go in off technology and Shea. Nobody, I mean, I can't say nobody. I, I haven't seen a truck go down Saguaro to go down the alley to laser to go up to any of the commercial buildings in 15 years. I mean, we see very, very, very little truck traffic but everybody is, I mean, I am so trained. You go up, <coughs> you turn down technology, and you go up laser. And that is the way that the majority of the folks that have been accessing laser drive for the last 15 years do it and know it. Most everybody has forgotten the old laser drive access to Saguaro and the technology drive to Saguaro. Most people have just completely forgotten it. And so, I mean, I've got, I've got a left-hand column and a right-hand column, and I've got seven or eight good reasons as to why that gate should be open. I mean, the taxpayers paid for the street. The, um, it's, it was there before the community was built. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but there's one reason that we shouldn't open it, and it's exactly the same reason that Vice Mayor brought up, and that is the council made a vow, the council said, We'll put that gate up so we can have laser drive, so we can have the uh, uh, target center. It was a, it was, it, it's in our notes, it's in our records, and just as Councilman Leger mentioned, which this is uh, at least the 35th or 36th time I've heard about it since the 17 years I've been on com the planning and zoning and on count council, and I would like to somehow put it to bed whether we make a permanent wall there, whatever needs to be done, but I'd like to put it to bed somehow. Okay, don't, nope. don't. Nope. <laughs> you can come up and talk after, after Randy and I'll, and I'll get everybody in, okay? Three minutes each person. But I'm still, I'm still, um, I'm still stuck on, on this part that, that if we, if we vote to close it, I don't want to open it so that the trucks go further and go through the alley. And we gotta figure <coughs> out how we're gonna stop them from doing that too. So whether it's um, any of these SRP or this this other, oh, the other buildings that are right here, do they have trucks that go in there or? SRPS. SRPS trucks or? Uh, Mayor, certainly SRP has trucks. Um, what about this? What is this building right next to it? Um, that actually accesses off the Saguaro. Okay. So what I'm saying is we close the gate and there's that, that's opening up the rest of the neighborhood for the trucks to continue all the way through. So I don't want to solve one problem and create another for the neighborhood. So if that's closed, we got to figure out a way how to stop truck traffic except for local traffic like SRP maybe from going all the way through. Do you understand what I'm, I'm trying to get at here? Because um, I don't want to create a worse situation for the neighbors while we're trying to fix, if we fix this and then create a worse situation for them. Mayor, if I may, I maybe can help clarify that. Go ahead. Okay, first of all, I agree with you. If you decide to have a permanent solution to closing the gate, um, frankly, I think if, if we go that way, we should get rid of the gate and cul-de-sac it, which is what they've done at the end of Laser Drive, separating that industrial area from that residential area. That was a solution many, many years ago. Um, I would agree that if the vote is to keep it closed, that yeah, signage would be helpful. I think the zoning in that area, uh, trucks shouldn't even be going down that road to begin with, but I'd have to... Um, have someone clarify that. Your concern regarding trucks, I think has already been answered in the traffic study. Right now, um, there's very few trucks that are going through there currently. And um, the ones that do go through there, because uh, I, I live in that area and I exercise there, are usually delivery trucks um, that are coming back and forth, which are basically vans. But right now, the um, study has said that there are very few trucks there, whether the gate is open or whether the gate's closed. So I don't think that's an issue. And getting back to something um, Councilman Tolis mentioned, um, yes, the answer to your question is th the main concern was with Target's loading zone, the concern was, yes, those Target 
trucks coming in through the gate. Um, the decisions being involved in that were primarily to um, prevent truck traffic in there. Um, and if you go through there occasionally, and I'm sure some of the neighbors may have photos of these, uh, there are semi-trucks. I don't know how they get in there, Dennis, but they're, they're parked in that area. So you can assure yourself that there'll be more of them if that gate is open. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Mayor, can Thomas. Justin uh, from our streets department address this in whether or not you're aware of any signage uh, that says that there's no commercial trucks to go down Saguaro? I, I ask that again, and I'm going to drive down tomorrow morning because I, I'm, I'm pretty certain that I saw signs when I went down there to evaluate this that it actually says when you're coming into Saguaro, no commercial trucks to be on that road. So just clarify, maybe if you know for sure or not, or it's something we need to look at, I don't know. Uh, Mayor Kavanaugh, Cal uh, Council Member Tullis, I'm not aware of a prohibition for truck in that area at this time. Um, we do have truck routes that are signed, but um, I'm not aware of a prohibition right there. I'll have to go and look. You can follow up on that, I think so. And then if they're, if they're, if they're not, what would it entail to actually have that established, that there would be no truck traffic that goes down that road, commercial trucks, that's, that is? Um, Mayor, uh, Councilman Tolis, uh, we have a, a section of the uh, town code that uh, um, designates truck routes, and uh, trucks other than those making local deliveries are supposed to uh, uh, drive the truck routes until they... Um, go to the nearest point to their local delivery so so we can we can address um, your concerns um, by reviewing uh, what our truck routes actually are and and also we'll, we'll verify that our signage actually agrees with what the uh, ordinance says too so <coughs> I still uh, I still have concern about that and I don't think that it would be a bad idea to sign the road so that we don't, you know, come back a year from now and say, well, there's not that many trucks, but they are going through and they are using the alley because we're still leaving an open way. So I think if we vote to close the gate, we, we should sign the road. Uh, you're saying the trucks should know, but it's, it's good to have a sign anyway. Mayor, actually, you know, you have to have the signage to make it actually legally enforceable, so. Right. Anything else? Does anybody want to make a motion? Do we want to listen to people? We could do the people first. Your call, Madam Mayor. How many people do we have? I'd make a motion. You want to make a motion? Sure. All right, let's do a motion first, and, uh, and then we'll have everybody can come up, okay? Uh, Mayor, I'd move to keep the gate closed and uh, make certain that there is a no truck sign, no heavy truck sign located as you turn on to, to um, Saguaro off of Shea, which I agree, I think there is one. Um, and I would also like to add to the motion to investigate the possibility of putting a cul-de-sac at the, at the intersection where technology currently enters to Saguaro. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. All right. Um, Just okay. okay, can I bring people up first? Well, it's related to the motion. I just, okay. Um, I'm just wondering if um, Councilman Brown wouldn't want to broaden that to have the staff look at alternative ways to, I mean, you mentioned a wall, for example. There might be alternative ways to, to deal with it. You mentioned the cold side. He did. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's not a wall. I mean, there may be. Never mind. Let it go. <laughs> Let it go. I'm happy. <laughs> All right. Let's start with people who don't want to speak but want to say whether they are for or against. Mayor, we have five cards for non-speakers, and they are all against opening the gate. Okay. It's Patricia DeSmith, De Andy Smith, Carol Nielsen, V. Middleton, and Steve Thompson. <coughs> okay. We have. Six cards of speakers. We start with Marianne Abrahamson, followed by Sherm Abrahamson. Are they related? <laughs> <laughs> Good 
mayor and council members. Um, I'm uh, Mary Ann Abrahamson. I live at Mirage Cove, which is the condo in question. Um, I have a letter before me, <clears throat> and I will read it to you, mayor and members of council. My name is Dan Diggins, president of Mirage Cove Homeowners Association. I'm sorry I could not attend tonight's hearing and have asked that this letter be read to council and placed into the record. When we were last before council, I was asked by a member of council if council would be hearing from us again if the lot by the gate were developed and a business placed there. I said I couldn't commit without HOA approval. I should have answered, if we as a board did commit, would you expect us to keep our word and honor our commitment? I believe the answer would be yes. For what good is our word if we cannot honor our commitments? Good community relations between local government and its citizenry are built upon trust. If government does not keep its word, the community trust is lost. The community has trusted you to honor your word and commitments. The only question that remains is, will you keep your word and honor your prior commitment to keep the gate closed? Respectfully, Dan Diggins, Mirage Cove HOA president. The gate has been closed for about 15 to 18 years. The question has come up, why is it imperative that it be open now? Thank you. Thank you. And Sherm, you're up. Followed by Pam Egaloo. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. As you all know, I'm Sherm Abrahamson. And yes, I'm related to that lady. <laughs> <clears throat> We've all been here before, and unfortunately, I'd like to, I'd like to see that not happen. Excuse me. I'd like to see that not come up again. I'd like to see this be a final issue. But I want to also present to you something you've seen before, but I'm saying it again because I want you to be have your mindset refreshed on some of these details. On March 2, 2017, the council voted 4 to 3 to conduct a 90-day traffic study. The study has now been completed, and the issue concerning the gate is once again before the council. At the March 2, 2017 council meeting, there were in excess of 30 people present who opposed the opening of the gate. To the contrary, only one person spoke in favor of opening the gate. Not one person from the business in the industrial park requested the gate be opened. However, it was stated by a local realtor that someone had spoken to a business in the park, and they were 100% in favor of opening the gate. Also, one of the councilmen stated he had spoken to a business and that the owner wanted the gate opened. The Mirage Cove HOA did their own survey and it was discovered there were no businesses which said that the closed gate had hurt their business and that the owner, the one who said specifically they wanted it open, did not say that. He contradicted that statement that had been made. I'm just specifically omitting the name of that person because he did not want his name brought before the world. No business contacted stated they wanted the gate open. You have seen the HOA business survey about the businesses we communicated with. I think there are 12 or 13 that we were able to communicate with, and all of them stated that the gate being closed did not cause their business any problems. Council is aware of the concerns of local residents opposed to opening the gate. Increased traffic and noise, commercial traffic in a residential area, Increased light in homes during the evening, contrary to Dark Skies Initiative, which Fountain Hills supports. And if I might parenthetically add, Mr. Diggins, our HOA president, his home is right in front of the gate. And so when any cars come through with their lights on, his house gets it. Limited turning radius for commercial vehicles turning to or from Saguaro Boulevard. This goes on and on. I think it is pertinent to say Oops, sorry, that this gate was installed prior to the construction of the U-Haul facility and U-Haul agreed to the gate remaining in place. There is absolutely no reason to abandon the town's prior commitment, change the existing plat, and infuse, uh, excuse me, increase traffic into the commercial residential area. The council should consider in weighing the options who would be disrupted more. Commercial and business traffic would be inconvenient slightly, if at all. However, the residential community would be disrupted 24-7. The gate has remained closed for 20 years. No businesses have been hurt. The residential community is opposed to opening the gate. The old adage applies, 
If it is not broken, why fix it? And quite frankly, that's pretty, that's pretty much the way we see it. it. There's no reason to change what's happening. I've said this before, our house is 45 steps from the gate. I see what's going on there every day, and I don't want to see it changed. Thank you. Pam Agalou, followed by Phyllis Kern. Mayor, Council, my name is Pam Agalou. I'm a resident of Fountain Hills, and I'm also one of those people that has too much stuff that's at U-Haul. Um, when I moved back to Arizona, I moved with a moving truck. My moving truck had to go to that storage unit and get turned around and all of that. It is quite cumbersome. Um, one thing that I thought about that, and I didn't know the political history of it, any of that, it's like, why is this here? It doesn't make good common sense for businesses and for people who have items at those units, businesses that have items that are in storage, to have to deal with a gate. Now, in deference to all of the homeowners that live in that area, I understand and I can empathize. Um, but they didn't buy homes or build homes that were not next to commercial property. And that is, that's the bottom line here. There is an assumed risk when you purchase anything if it is in any sort of adjacent nature to commercial property or a main thoroughfare that things can change. And unfortunately, um, for those of us who haven't lived here and don't know the way that all the locals go, trying to find to get to U-Haul was, was a little bit cumbersome. And where we're trying to entice people to move to Fountain Hills, to make them understand that we want them to be here, um, having a gate in a place that, that unless you know all of this emotional history, it does not seem to make sense. Now there's no school near there, there are no children playing near there where you would normally see a gate, something that would impede traffic from going in and out. There isn't anything like that in here. And I believe me, I understand about lights in, the, in your uh, window because I live off of La Montana and I hear fire engines. I don't like it. I'm not happy about it, but that was also an assumed risk of buying the condominium that I did. Um, I would ask that as a council, you take into consideration the whole of Fountain Hills, not just an HOA, not just people who have an emotional reason for wanting this gate open or not open. Please use a common sense approach does this benefit the businesses that are in that commercial district? Does it not benefit the businesses that are in the commercial district? That's it, thank you. Okay, thank you. Next. Phyllis Kern followed by Frank Finkelman. Phyllis Kern, Kern Realty, Mayor, County Council. Um, I'm just gonna hit on a couple items. When we were here last time, you remember the, the HOA president was saying there was five to seven homes that was getting lights from technology if that gate was open. Well, I physically went down there. There's one home, 105, that has a dining room that will get the light. Now, so that negates that. But I suggest these same people go down to the alley and you go down there when the, in that night when the lights come on, there's definitely five to seven homes that get lights at night. So I don't know where the discrepancy, but why we can't play fair here. <laughs> Number two, and U-Haul, I've, I've been in conversation with them, and they've been scared to come here because they have been told that if they get vocal, that someone's gonna take their trucks away. They've got the storage units here, but they also have U-Haul trucks. So they have been told twice that don't participate. They've told their customers and everything, but they, have, they themselves can't, because they'd be the most logical one. Number two, you've got a two and a half acre piece of property right across the street from there that's vacant right now. That would be a real asset for Fountain Hills if we got that built. So if, if we have the gate closed, again, we're just shooting ourselves in the foot. 
Some items that you're not thinking of or not, you, you're not considering. When you GPS that area over there, GPS takes you to that area. Um, <laughs> I've lived over there for nine years. Glenn Ford, who passed away, we've observed, we've watched big trucks turn around on that road. And if you put your sign up there like you're suggesting, all you're gonna do is compound the problem because they're gonna be turning around on some world boulevard to get back out to go over to technology drive. So, or over to, um, okay. yeah, technology, excuse me. So, number two, the alley. <laughs> I've seen so many people so close when you go in basically southwest on the alley out to Saguaro, you cannot see traffic come around that curve. And granted, it's been four years, no accidents. But trust me, sometimes, someplace, something's gonna happen. We're all gonna be sitting here going, what happened? Okay, why did we have that allowed to happen? My suggestion, if you wanna leave the alley there, then let's make that a regular main street. Let's widen it and make it so vehicles can get in and out of the industrial park. Another thing that has not been said tonight, and I wish I had the photograph up here, the back of Target has been used as an alleyway to get back and forth for people. I follow many of people <laughs> back there. They, they come up that ramp, take the back end of Target over to Laser. No one has said a word about that. So. The industrial park was basically built to help our town. It was built to, 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 to bring monies in here. And, that, and that's our purpose, is to, is to basically be forward-minded. We're the only community in America, I know that we have our main entrance to the industrial park blocked by a gate. And it's so silly. We're shooting ourselves in the foot as we try to bring people to town, and they start driving around seeing this. It's a hard one to explain as a realtor. So with that, I just say we've got to become business friendly, make this happen. Um, we, if you want us to become an old retirement community, <laughs> we're well on our way, OK? We've got to change our thoughts and process here. Like Dennis Brown said, we've got seven good reasons, one not. Well, I think it's time now that we got to look at the seven reasons and, and act. Thank you. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, okay. All right. Sure. Phyllis, you've been, um, in my mind, sort of the leading advocate for closing True. the gate. Yeah. And I don't criticize you for, I mean, for opening the gate. I don't criticize you for that at all. I'm just a little curious. You lived there in that area? I lived there for nine years over on Tombstone and... Um, I lived on Tombstone. And do you have any commercial activity yourself in that area? I know you're a realtor, but... No, I, about 12 years ago, the chamber was holding uh, functions where they would bring in like the industrial park. We had all 19 owners there one time. All 19 owners passed that they wanted two things. They wanted the, the gate open, they wanted better signage. At that time, Mayor Schlum and Henry Leger came to our meeting at the end and said, nope, we're not gonna honor it, so. So this is for, as you see it, your convenience as well as your neighbor's convenience? Yes. Then where are all the people who are for opening it who are your neighbors? Number one, it was so poorly publicized as far as this meeting tonight. Number two, I wish you could table it so we could bring the people here. I mean, I was on the phone up <laughs> from nine o'clock this morning and a couple of my advocates who I wish were here because you know they'd be a little more vocal than I would be. So Oh you do okay for yourself. <laughs> I work at it. Because you know? I know when you see a problem, let's solve it. Let's not brush over. Like Dennis said, we've got seven good reasons, one bad one. I mean, let's be considerate of each other. I mean, one, we had a guy, their HOA guy, who lied to us and said, hey, you know, all these signs are, all these lights are coming to their buildings. Well, I went down there purposely then to check it out. One home, number 105, gets the light. But go down to the alleyway. There's tons of homes getting lights. So why are we playing good cop, bad cop here? Okay, Thank thanks, you. Phyllis. Thank you. I don't want to put Phyllis on the spot anymore. Mayor, if I may, my name was mentioned, and I would like to respond to Ms. Kearns, please, as a matter of order. Okay. Phyllis, you want to come up here again, please? You don't have to. It's, it's whether you want to. Just make that clear. Ms. Kearns, uh, it's good to see you. I think you lived on the corner of Leo and Tombstone. Right. You were searching for that. Um, just for the record, every time you and I have had a correspondence, and I have a, full, a folder full of correspondence from you, 
where I very politely mentioned that I don't have a, any skin in the game and I'm simply interested in honoring the commitment of the board members. And each time I went to the board and they unanimously um, asked, uh, they, they wanted it closed and I would email you back and basically say that the wishes of the HOA are X and I'm gonna honor that commitment. And in response to that, you've, you've continually mentioned this thing about 19 business owners and Mayor Schlum and myself. Frankly, I was not in that meeting, nor was I in that subgroup. You were not in the group. You were with Mayor Schlum that day when we were bringing our recommendations to you. And the two recommendations at that time was open the gate and better signage for the industrial park. The recommend, there was, at that time, there was a Business Vitality Advisory Council, which I was on, and, and you joined that occasionally. Um, that group created a number of task force, and task force went out and looked at different issues in town, one of which was the issue you're referring to. That task force came back to the Business Vitality Advisory Executive Board, and it was the Executive Board unanimously that thought that the gate should stay, stay closed. And I just want to refresh your memory. I would disagree with you. I don't, that is not the way it happened whatsoever, but you know, that's your really, my recollection. And, one, and one, one last thing from our last correspondence, and I want to clarify this for the record as well. You stated, as, you drove, as, as I drove by the gate this morning when this was written, my thought was how many of those people put money into your campaign? And That's if you question, if you want the answer to that question, feel free to look in my financial disclosure records, and you'll find your answer. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll find that it's zero. So I'd appreciate it if you st stop. All right, writing Phyllis. This. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you for coming up. Who's next? Here we have two final speakers: Frank Finkelman, followed by Kelly Smith. Mayor and council members. First, I'd like to just clarify. And you are your name? Oh, Frank Finkelman. And I live from, in Mirage Cove. You just say Fountain Hills. In Fountain Hills. That's good. Okay. Directly across from the gate. Okay. First, let me clear up that U Haul business. U Haul is very happy that that gate was there uh, because I worked with your husband, Dr. Kavanaugh, on this business with U Haul and their running of trucks, which they were running illegally. The uh, gate. Uh, provided a chance for them to get a special use permit to run gates. And the only reason we never objected to that was because the gate was there. So I just wanted to clarify that You meant first. to run trucks. Excuse me? You meant to run trucks? To run trucks, okay. to rent trucks. To rent they trucks. They was built originally, u haul was never even approved. It was another uh, storage unit. And u haul took that over, and it was never meant for trucks. Okay. And uh, your husband and I worked on that problem. Okay. All uh, right. Now, in, uh, let us be clear why we are here tonight. We are not here to decide whether or not to open the gate. That issue was decided long ago and reinforced by subsequent councils. That decision was to install a gate and to keep it closed. Why are we here? <coughs> Excuse me. We are here to see if this council is going to renege on the promises made to our community by previous councils. Doesn't this council have an obligation to keep promises made and retain the integrity of the council and the trust of the residents? Then why renege? Those with a vested interest in the gate either do not care or want it closed. So who is it that wants the gates opened? A decision to renege could make this issue a political football bouncing around the town councils that follow this one. I say let's put this to bed now and let sleeping dogs lie. As a side issue, I understand there is supposedly a problem with traffic in the alley. I suggest a novel idea. Let's put a gate there as well and totally separate the industrial area from the residential area as is done in many communities. Thank you. Okay, thanks Frank. Next. Last speaker, Kelly Smith. Madam 
Madam Mayor, Council members, um, I am here on behalf of, oh, I'm Kelly Smith, I'm a realtor here in Fountain Hills with MCO Realty. I am actually here on behalf of one of the property owners that is in the industrial complex, that is in favor of the gates being open. He owns uh, the vacant parcel on the corner, uh, 2.75 acres industrial lot. He owns that. He also owns several buildings in that uh, immediate complex right next door. Um, I had called him on this this, uh, this afternoon and asked him um, what his response is and he told me he would like the gate open. Um, so I am here on his behalf. I also had an office in the Target Shopping Center right, behind, uh, right at the entrance of the ramp there and Phyllis was correct. People use the back end of Target every day to get back in the laser. I see it all the time. There's no other reason for somebody to go back behind Target there um, except for to get access to uh, laser. Okay. Um, I guess that's about all I have to say is my client is, is a property owner. He does own business there and he does own other buildings there and he is in favor of it. So um, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions at all? No? Okay. That's okay. Anyone else? No, that's it. Uh, further council discussion? Was that Councilman Tolis? Were you? No. Councilman Jay, you have something I, else? I had a question for Kelly, and you don't have to come up here if you can hear me. I think your voice, your voice carries. You know, I had that same thought because I, I drive the, by there occasionally, and I, I noticed that property was leveled. Um, I know in the past, um, when that property was looked at for development years ago, that um, the owner of that property was advocating with P&Z to bring an entryway coming in off of Saguaro, um, which would allow traffic off of Saguaro into that particular piece of property, which would be prior to Mirage Cove. Um, so my thought is that if and when that's developed, I think that would be a viable solution to come into that particular piece of property that is something that um, I had talked with head planner and, and different people about you know whoever buys the property can kind of determine what they want to do if they want to put an industrial complex there if they want to put a shopping center there they want to put storage units there whatever they want to put in there um, you know the question was can they get access from Saguaro to get into that property um, their frontage is primarily all along Saguaro. They have only a small section along Laser Drive. Um, majority of the, the access, uh, the frontage of the property is along Saguaro Boulevard. And uh, I guess whoever buys it will wanna see about if they can get access, like Target has. Um, they're gonna probably look at something along the same yeah. lines. Sure, I'm, I'm sure that uh, is, is a possibility. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other council discussion? Could you repeat your motion, please, Councilman Brown? It's been a while. I believe I can repeat that. Thank you. Mayor, I move to uh, keep the gates closed, and I move to put a sign up uh, limiting truck access onto Saguaro, and I would like to add to it to the feasibility of putting in a cul-de-sac in lieu of the gate to end Technology Drive. And we still have a second? Okay. Um, one last question for Randy. If there's a sign up, will SRP still have access? Because I know they were concerned about the very few times that they have to go through there. Would, is there any way to ensure that they could still go through? I'm sure the neighbors wouldn't mind if they're how do you do, is there a way how to do that? Uh, Mayor, we'd have to look at that. Um, okay, but we could look at that to. Um, if I'm, I did find the uh, data that you were asking about oh, earlier. Oh. Um, it actually is in your packet, uh, but I didn't make a slide on it because. Oh, it's okay. Um, our, our data was that uh, uh, average number of trucks on Saguaro, gate closed 11, gate open 11. Um, the alley, gate closed four. Uh, gate open four and technology, gate closed, of course, zero, and gate open one. And th that's a daily number of trucks, and that's three axles or more. So, okay. so basically no change in the number of trucks 
um, okay. it, they didn't reroute. Well, thanks for that did. additional information. Okay, so um, I guess we'll go with a roll call vote. Councilmember Tolis. Am I always deciding vote on these things? <laughs> You're the no, first one. Just You're first. off the hook. Trust me, I'll be the deciding vote. Um, for the moment, we're going to keep it closed. So that's an I. That's an I. <laughs> that would be a correct. How do you spell that? Councilmember Leger. Aye. Councilmember Yates. Um, along the same lines, there, there's no increase in traffic. There's no night traffic. There's no precedence for closing a road. Um, I'm for connectivity, but I'm also for honoring um, some uh, um, promises that were made. But it, it seems like the promises that were made were based on commercial traffic. Um, until we get this cul-de-sac or some other permanent fix, I, this may come back up because there's no precedence for this, but at this point, I'll, I'll side with uh, the precedence, and I think I say aye. <laughs> Thank you. Vice Mayor Magazine. Aye. Councilmember Brown. Aye. And Mayor Kavanaugh. Aye. Mayor 6-0. Nope. I was in school. It starts with A first. Okay. We're done. No, 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 don't, don't, don't. Okay. And we apologize for, there's no sound on channel 11. If you wanted to go back and look at it, there's some technical difficulties. Unless you want to do it over. <laughs> oh, please. Okay. That you were. All right, we'll give you a minute to, to get out, and then we'll bring the firemen up. It's good we start these meetings earlier, huh? Sure. Amen. Yeah. Otherwise, it would have been 8.30. All right. Consideration of Cooperative Purchase Agreement, C-2017-050, with Rosenbauer, South Dakota, LLC, for the acquisition of a new 2017 Rosenbauer 101 ladder truck in an amount not to exceed 975000 to... <laughs> Bless, Bless you. you. To cover the cost of the truck plus the tax. Grady. Thank you, Mayor. Um, before you is a request um, on, the, on the part of the fire station, or excuse me, the fire department to request a replacement for our current ladder truck. Our current ladder truck is going on, uh, I believe, 20 years, and it's at the um, end of its useful life. And the other thing that's becoming challenging with it is that the company is uh, no longer in existence. And so, therefore, it's getting harder and harder to support. You recall that we had a um, discussion about this when we went into the, um, the, I believe it was a council retreat this past year. Um, we talked about the fire truck. And one of the things that council asked at the time is for us to look at some other options, such as uh, lease and lease purchase. Um, the staff went ahead and did that, and it looks, since we keep vehicles like this for 20 years or so, the additional cost for, for lease, um, the, the lease factor rate would make this either another 120000 or um, 100, I believe, 72000 72, So we recommend at this point just to go ahead and purchase it um, at this cost. I know that we have a presentation. I'll go ahead and turn it over to the fire chief who will go through his presentation. And I'm sorry, our deputy chief is here as well that mm -hmm. may have some points to chime in on. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. And uh, I want to thank Jason for all his technical expertise on putting this together. And uh, he's here because I'm technically challenged. But all right. So, so yeah. with us is Chief uh, Dave Ott and <coughs> Assistant Chief Jason Payne. Um, Town Manager uh, Miller kind of stated a lot of the, the things that are up front. We're, we're, we've been budgeted to replace a truck. Normally it had a 15 year lifespan. Um, with the state of the vehicle replacement fund, we had bumped that out to 20 years. Uh, as he stated, some of the things that are challenges for us is that the uh, manufacturer of the apparatus, as well as the manufacturer of the ladder on top of it are no longer in business. And it's getting a little more difficult to get parts and maintain that. With that being said, also the, the engine that's the power plant on it um, is an old Detroit en engine. It's got 1993 uh, emission standards to it, which is not very effective. 
and that soon is going to be obsolete as well. So um, as we're going through this, our current ladder, uh, it's a 1997 ladder, but what that really means is that uh, the chassis had been put together and then the rest of the truck came together in 98. So it's that, we, we kind of refer to it as a 98 uh, American La France. Uh, they've been out of business since 2014. Parts are no longer available. Um, we've been uh, kind of lucky at some point that we've had some uh, enterprising mechanics that have been able to, to fab up some parts. But if we have anything structural, body type parts on, on the engine that fail, we're no longer able to get those or replace those. Uh, we'd have to go out and search on, on eBay. Um, currently, the ladder does not meet uh, ISO requirements for mid rise and high rise structures. And we know as, as things are going, we're getting a little bit taller uh, with our vertical buildings. Um, the maintenance costs have, have increased. Um, and again, we've, we've got the 1993 EPA standards on, on the uh, engine itself. Uh, what we're proposing is a 101 foot aerial platform. Uh, it would meet ISO ratings. Uh, the, our current rating is three. Uh, this new uh, apparatus would allow us to to possibly move into a, a two or a one, and I'm, I'm sure that everybody that kind of looks at the ISO rating and the insurance uh, benefits that that provides us uh, would also allow us to be a little bit more attractive to some businesses coming in that would benefit from a, a lower uh, ISO rating. Um, it meets the current needs of the town for the, the height of the new buildings. It would allow for higher buildings if P&Z would, would agree with that. Um, it would be built to current EPA standards for emissions. Uh, the 2017 ladder truck standards and NF NFPA requirements are greater than what they were, so we'd be getting a safer piece of equipment. Um, it, the, the new platform would be better on a vertical as well as a horizontal um, aspect for us as far as access to things. Uh, it's safer for rescues and the aerial firefighting use of the platform. We no longer would have to have someone climb up the ladder, which is always a risk for us when you've got uh, 60 to 80 pounds of additional gear on. The platform gives us a, a better working area and we're no longer having somebody to have to climb up that ladder to get to the top of it. Uh, it's also a little bit safer for us load, loading hose on the truck. Um, this actually has a side load for our large diameter hose, which we take off the truck every time we have to hydro. Um, Rosenbauer is a, a non-proprietary ladder, so we're not stuck into um, using them for the parts as we, we have future maintenance needs. The state of the art of technology for firefighter safety and speed for setting up is there. Um, it's, a, it's a very uh, modern, technical, savvy truck, but it's not over the top and it's something that I could probably work with, <laughs> with minor training, uh, maybe remedial training. Um, this is a stock truck that's already built. Um, it's actually sitting at the Rosenbauer plant in South Dakota at this point. Uh, if we were to do a custom build, it would be a 360-day typical build. Um, and now, that's pretty typical for any type of apparatus that you would have as a custom build. And the stock truck saves approximately uh, $300,000 off of the cost of a custom truck. Uh, it's got a uh, one-piece windshield with zero blind spots, which is similar to a lot of new RVs, and it would have a, uh, we'd be able to replace that windshield from an RV shop opposed to uh, what we have now, which is an old two-piece, uh, really custom-made windshield. Um, it's kind of a couple shots of it. And I would like to say that we, we have also conferred with our uh, fleet manager, uh, public works director, Mr. Weldy um, going through this and the, the vehicle replacement, he's in agreement that uh, um, this would be a, a good quality piece of equipment for the town. And we did do our due diligence on the uh, lease options and you can kind of see the breakdown here um, with the, the annual payments, the total after payment, um, and the total purchase price after the 8.3% Arizona tax uh, would be 963,887.33. And thanks to the finance director, um, Mr. Rigolfi, we came up with those figures. At that point, uh, that kind of concludes our presentation. Do you have any questions? Questions?
Uh, Councilman Brown. Would you rather have a new station or a new truck? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Wow. Uh oh. Meeting mm -hmm. adjourned. <laughs> <laughs> You guys deserve both. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're really uh, talking about safety here, especially for the firefighters. And I'm kind of a little concerned about buying parts on eBay. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't uh, always work out for even other things other than truck parts that we really need to make sure that it's safe and it's up to date. And I got to see the truck that you were, you were interested in. And I don't know that much about trucks, but you know, it's, I take your word for it that if you say this is what you really need, we want you to have the best. Councilman Yates. Thank you, Mayor. Guys, great presentation and you did your homework. I really appreciate that. And it sounds like this is the right decision. So thank you. Councilman Brown. Will, will they deliver that or will we flap and drive it back? You, they will deliver it? Yes. As much as Jason wants to go to South Dakota <laughs> and drive it back, um, they, they will bring it out for us and uh, we'll take delivery for it here and pay for it. So. And what's the time frame on, on the new delivery? 30 to 45 days. Yes, approximately 30 to 45 days from the time that, that I give them notice, either yes or no. Um, so like I said, it's already built. They have to put all the Town of Fountain Hills stickers and emblems on it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple little changes that they're going to do for us uh, at no cost. So they promised, I'm trying to get it here for Thanksgiving. Oh, that'd be nice. Okay. That'd be nice. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. Councilman Leger. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, gentlemen, what um, budget line item is this coming out of this? Is this vehicle replacement? For you? Yes. Okay. All of it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Very good. And last question, what's the gas mileage? <laughs> Gosh, you guys. It's approximately 3.7, where the current ladder is 1.2. Ooh. Wow, that's huge. Oh, yeah. Double. Wow. Yeah. We're, in, we're, in, tagline. we're in business, as long as you don't have to leave Fountain Hills. <laughs> like go to Texas or something like that. Oh, Vice Mayor. Just a very minor question. Um, and maybe Craig has to answer this. Where does the 8.3% on taxes come from? Is, are there different categories that affect this? Uh-oh. We'll refer to the finance department. Yeah. Right. Sorry, Craig. Councilman Magazine, I believe that 8.3 is South Dakota tax rate. Arizona's tax rate would be 8.9%. Oh, South Dakota, okay. I'm, that escaped me. Okay, thank you. Anything else? If not, I'll, any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Councilman Yates. Madam Mayor, I move to approve the Cooperative Purchase Agreement C2017-050 uh, with Rosenbauer South Dakota LLC for the acquisition of the new 2017 Rosenbauer 101 foot ladder truck in the amount not to exceed 975,000 to cover the cost of the truck plus the tax. I have a motion, do I have a second? Second. All right, any further council discussion? Falling. Mayor, th doesn't it say the purchase price is 963,887.33? Purchase price is 967,887.33 after the 8.3% AZ taxes. Where's the 975 come in? Madam Mayor, it's not to exceed. So if it's less than that, not knowing what all the final charges are, I you guys can handle this. <laughs> uh, Madam Mayor, Councilman Tullis, um, in talking with the finance director, Craig Rodolfi, we, we felt comfortable with that 975 to cover anything that might come up that might not be there um, <coughs> in the original. So it, it was just <coughs> that extra little cushion layer in there. Um, it, it will be what, what it is after the taxes. Mayor, that will probably cover gas. That is. <laughs> Need another 10 grand. Yeah, right. Um, is there a discount for cash? That was a joke. <laughs> All in favor of the motion. <laughs> Aye. Any opposed? Mayor 6-0. Okay. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. We would have to go up there. <laughs> consideration, of, consideration of donating the Town of Fountain Hills 1998 American La France ladder truck to the Port Aransas Fire Department to replace their ladder truck damaged in Hurricane Harvey. Grady? Thank you, uh, Mayor. 
Um, the chief and I, um, you know, right after Hurricane Harvey, we were, you know, kind of wondering if, if there was possibility that we could donate this to a um, hurricane community. And initially there were no reports that there were fire departments that had lost um, apparatus. The value of this on a surplus um, trade-in, um, or not even a trade-in, but just the surpluses out, would be 20000 to 30000 um, The The chief has a, a brief presentation on this, but I, we want to just tell you that um, we felt very deeply um, connected to our uh, neighbors um, in, in Texas because of the hurricane. Um, the situation is most of the communities um, across the country, just like people that have homes, do not carry flood insurance. And so when these situations occur, communities have total losses sometimes. And this is a, a community that was particularly hard hit from this hurricane. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the chief who has a, a brief presentation and some visuals to show you what they went through. Thank you. Again, Madam Mayor, Council. Um, the Port Aransas Volunteer Fire Department was created in the 40s and has about 24 volunteers. They serve a community of about 3,500 people. Port Aransas uh, population also increases uh, due to, uh, over the year due to uh, tourism. They also have a numerous multi-story hotels in the response area that require a ladder truck. When Hurricane Harvey was inbound, it was predicted to be a Category 1 storm with a small storm surge. It was at that point that most of the fire department members evacuated the, the island with plans to return uh, when the, when the uh, storm had passed. When Harvey made landfall, the storm surge pushed three feet of salt water into the station, damaging or destroying all of the, the department's apparatus. All of the motors and electrical systems were inundated with salt water. Port Aransas Chief uh, Shanklin is trying very hard to get his department up and running, and your support is very much appreciated on this. And here's a few slides. Um, this is their, their station. Um, you can kind of see the damage from the, from the front. There's also some side damage, and this is where all of their apparatus was housed. Um, this is the, the truck that our truck would, would replace. Again, they know the, the stats on it. Um, they're fully aware of America and the France being out of business, uh, the ladder manufacturer being out of business. This will get them back up and running, and it would be a short-term fix for them, but it would be a very welcome fix. And at this point, um, they have, have had one uh, engine donated and one brush truck donated. So they're kind of getting some of their stuff back together, but the latter would, would be a big plus for them. Um, get a little more damage to the, their engine. And you can see where it came through in the bays. They had quite a bit of cleanup to, to do through there. And this would be through a uh, helping Hands program that the uh, Texas Forestry has through Texas A&M, which is uh, they passed a state law to be able to help uh, volunteer in smaller departments with, with donations of apparatus. Uh, it would leave us uh, completely indemnified. Um, once they got it, they would bring a flatbed up here and drive it back on a flatbed to Texas uh, and take it back across the island. Um, we've also discussed uh, this um, disposition of the truck with uh, Fleet Manager, Public Works Director, uh, Mr. Weldy, and he's in agreement uh, that, that donating to this department in need is a, a good means of disposing of this equipment. Okay. These pictures are just really telling the whole, probably not the whole story, because this looks like it's after it settled down and they were able to get back in there. Um, but, you know, when, when Grady mentioned to me about the possibility of doing this, I mean, I didn't even hesitate. I just thought that this would be a wonderful gift from the people of Fountain Hills. This is not coming from just us. This is coming from our whole town. To give something like this is truly incredible. And I know that there's a lot of people who said, you know, gee, I wish I had money or something that I could donate to, to the people over there because everybody felt um, 
their, their hearts just went out to all the people and how many people lost their homes. And so this is, this is a way for the entire town to be able to do something good and to give them this gift. So I'm 100% I'm in favor of this. Vice Mayor? Um, unless you've been there, you really can't grasp just from the TV and newspapers and so on what's really like. Um, I was with the Red Cross in Biloxi three days after Katrina. And I can't even begin to describe the destruction, the smell of dead bodies, uh, couples with little kids picking through belongings, looking for things. Uh, it'll affect me the rest of my life. And uh, whatever we can do to help these folks, we ought to do. Uh, I'm completely for this. I wish we could do more. Um, and we're only talking about one small town in one place. And think about what's going on uh, in Florida, what's going on in Puerto Rico. And I, it's mm -hmm. just absolutely devastating. So I just want to thank the staff for thinking about this yeah. uh, and say that I'm completely for this. Okay. Chief, if you could just tell the council, I, I know you shared it with me, but um, could you tell how many uh, fire trucks and apparatus now the final t tally is? Because I was shocked when I heard this in Texas. Um, yeah, and for some reason that's slipping my mind. It, I it, thought it was 140, it, perhaps. Yeah, I was say, it, it was over, I think over 140 total apparatus. Throughout all of Texas, so that's huge. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions or discussion? If not, who would like to make this motion? So moved. <laughs> okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <clears throat> Mayor 6-0. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank job, you guys. for all your work. Wow. Thanks for bringing this to us. We will, we will bring the platform over when we get it. And this okay. time everyone gets it right in after. All right. Well, All right, we don't have any uh, direction to town manager. Uh, anything in summaries? Anybody, any meetings, anything anybody wants to talk about? No, if not, it's not too late, so let's go for an adjournment. So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed?